I may write a book because <laughs> I've got all kinds of information. But we've been working on the habits of highly effective believers. I, I was praying at first, before the first of the year, what are the things that we can do that are going to help us in our walk with the Lord, help us to be more effective in our witness here on earth and, and do all the things that the Lord has called us to do. And the thing that I thought about was, just like at the first of the year, we all make resolutions. We're going to do something different this year. And uh, I don't want this to be a resolution. I don't want it to be something that uh, gets forgotten about and that we drop after a month. But the thing that I, the, the, the text that we've been looking at is Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And Jesus said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily and follow me. The thing is, human nature gets in the way. We want things the easy way. We like things that are free. We like to, to do it the easy way. We like drive throughs ATM, shopping on the Internet, all that good stuff that makes it so convenient. And sometimes that flows into our, our relationship with the Lord. We want things very, very quick, very, very easy. We want the Cliff Notes version of the Bible. We want the drive through access of prayer, and we want ATM access to God's blessing. The only thing is it doesn't always happen that way. So we've, we've got to do some things. We've got to commit ourselves to, to work into our lives some habits that are going to be effective for our Christian walk. We started on this m several weeks ago. Chad will be glad to make you a CD if you missed any of them, but we'll just very, very quickly hit the titles. Uh, have a real relationship with God. That's no spare tire religion. That's why we got a spare tire. If you're visiting and wondering what is all this stuff doing up on the platform. Uh, sometimes we treat God like a spare tire. We put him in the trunk, forget about him until there's an emergency. And then we want to whip it out and we want it to work. We don't, don't bother to check the air in that tire, but we always expect it to be there. So that's first. Second is make a habit of reading God's Word. David said, your word is a, a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. We won't know where we're headed without God's Word. Three, pray according to God's agenda. In other words, we've got to get the mind of God to be able to know what He wants specifically too many times i think we pray and i'm guilty of it too we pray selfish prayers i want is how we start a lot of our prayers so number four depend on the holy spirit he was sent here as our helper our guide through life why not access that number five get rid of your excess baggage that's why the trash bags are there too many times we drag the wrong things through life too many times we're, we're packing stuff that God didn't intend for us to be packing. Number six, makes the most of your experiences. In other words, we're going to have things that come in our life. We have an opportunity to learn from those, make the most of it. Number seven, learn how to handle a crisis constructively. It's coming. Amen? Crisis is on the way. How are you going to handle it? If God's not, you know, it's one thing to say God's here and God's our God on Sunday morning, but what about on Wednesday when it's not going real well? And um, we got to handle a crisis constructively. Number eight, we talked about it last week, grasp the big picture. I gave everybody a little piece of, several little pieces of a puzzle. And nobody, strangely enough, could guess what the big picture was. But here's the thing. God takes all of our little pieces, and he's got a big picture. And that's why it's so important that we are all here, that we all come together, because we all carry little pieces of the puzzle. When we come together, it makes a beautiful picture that God already had in mind. Amen? Number nine, and this is today. If you weren't here, want any of those CDs, Chad would love to make them for you. But number nine, what is a habit of a highly affected believer? Pick your battles. We're going to have some, some fights. We are, we are, fact is, we are called to be soldiers in the army of the Lord. Paul talks about it, makes mention of it in a couple of places, most specifically 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 3 and 4, he says, Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life where they cannot please the officer who enlisted them if they do. And the thing is, we're called to be in the army of the Lord. So many times we don't look at it that way kind of like the guy I heard about a pastor that he'd always go to the back door and shake everybody's hand on the way out on Sunday morning there was this one fella he'd come to church about twice a year he was one of those Christmas and Easter kind of guys 
And so one day the pastor made a concerted effort to get to the door before this guy hit the back door and he grabbed him by the hand and shook it and he said, young man, we'd sure love to have you in the service of the Lord. And uh, the guy said, well, I am. The pastor was kind of shocked and he said, oh, really? He said, how come we only see you on, uh, on Christmas and Easter? And that guy said, I'm in the secret service. <laughs> the Lord is not wanting the secret service. He's wanting some green berets, amen, some commandos for the army of the Lord. He's wanting people to get in there and get the job done and get it over with. And so we are all called into the army of the Lord. Uh, there's so many scriptures that talk to this particular issue. In First Peter chapter 5, um, Peter writes this, he says, Stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. That's army talk. Stay alert, be on watch. Uh, in 2 uh, Corinthians 10, uh, Paul writes this, he says, We're human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul writes this. He says, we're not fighting against blood, flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Um, here's the thing. We can get all caught up in that. We can make a doctrine out of that right there. Oh, we're supposed to be fighting all the time. And I've known so many believers that are just fighting, 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 fighting. All the time. It's a battle. There's something big going on. They thrive on the drama. Every, every week or every day or every few days. Ah, oh, it's this terrible thing. Oh, we're fighting, 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 fighting. But we have to balance that with the fact of what the Lord said. He said, come unto me all ye that labor and are burdened down with heavy loads. And what? I'm going to give you rest. So we balance those two things, that we're called into the service of the Lord, but yet he knows that we need downtime. He knows that we need rest. And John writes in 1 John chapter 4, he said, But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people, talking about those who would fight against Christ, because the Spirit who lives in you is greater than the Spirit who is in the world. In other words, he's telling us we're not fighting for victory, we are fighting from victory. It's not all about a, a fight, fight, fight all the time. One of the things that you look at Jesus' life, he knew when to do battle, and he knew when to have some quiet time. You saw him when he went into the wilderness, the devil comes in and tempts him, and buddy, he just bang, 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 he's, he's waging war with the Word of God, and he calls Satan out. Satan can't stand it when we call him out. Amen. As I've said before, the word's very, very clear. Resist the devil. He's going to flee because he's going to look for somebody that's easy prey. He does not like to work hard for what he does. So if we'll, if we'll get the, full of the word of God and if we'll resist him, then he's going to flee. And the thing that we've got to do is realize that Jesus, when he was on this earth, he knew when to fight. He knew what battle was important. And he knew when to go and relax. You see Jesus in every morning and every evening. What did he do? He went and got in a quiet place and got alone with the Father. That was how he knew what his will was. That was, that was so important to him to get away and to get away from the hustle and bustle. There are people that I know and you know that, that just thrive on drama, it seems like. That's not the way God intends for us to live our lives. Not just going from one little putting out a fire here to putting out a fire there. Know what's important. And so the, some, some of the things that we can do to help us along in our walk with the Lord is know what battle is important. Because uh, there's two, two ways that Satan is pleased with our actions. And that is that we say there is no devil that there is no enemy, that there is no person who's out there working against God. Or the second way is that he's involved in everything. That there is a demon behind every bush and, and a devil behind every tree. And oh my goodness, I ran out of uh, gas on the way to work and it was the devil! No, it's because you were busy and you forgot to buy gas. Amen? <laughs> so there's two ways. Either there's not a devil or we give him credit for everything. 
And, and neither one of those is correct. The truth is, the devil is involved in some things. And the thing that we've got to realize, there's a time and a place to call him out. There's a time and a place to relax. There's a time and a place for everything. And the word is very, very clear about that. We're all, as I said, we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. We, Jesus fought and won the battle. So what we've got to do is realize there's a time and a place to do real battles. So pick your battles. Know what's important. In military science, and this is probably this little section may bore some of you, but please listen because it is important to the rest of the message. In military science, there is an aspect of winning a battle that's so important and it's called decisive points of conflict. If you went to military academy, they're going to teach you this particular issue. Because there are certain ways and certain places and certain things that are so vitally important that they're worth fighting for, there are other things that are not. If you've got your soldiers running here and running there and doing this and doing that to where they're totally exhausted all the time, mentally, physically, and otherwise, then when the real battle happens, they're worthless. The thing that we've got to do is realize that that also applies to our battle with the enemy and our walk with the Lord. If we're continually just running and, and always excited about something, always drama going on in our lives, then the thing is we're going to wear ourselves out and when the real battle comes, we're going to be so totally exhausted emotionally, spiritually, and otherwise that we're not even going to be worthwhile in the battle. Uh, if you look at decisive points of conflict, there are certain ways that this happens in the military. They also apply to our spiritual walk. There's psychological warfare. In all recent wars, that's been a big issue as far as carrying out the, the plans of, of, of one side or the other. It's the psychological warfare to demoralize the enemy, strategic bombing, hit a certain area, take out a certain, a certain line of communication or, or, or take a certain geographical area, uh, take the high ground. And here's the thing, God always wants us to take the high ground. Amen? You can't get on the devil's level. You've got to take the high ground. You've got to do things the right way. Communications is another way. If the devil can come in and break down communications be it in a church, be it in a family, be it in any situation, then all of a sudden he's won great inroads into, into the battle. Uh, logistics, that's supply lines, that's railways, highways, supply lines in, in, in particular, that's one way that the enemy can come in and, and win a great stride forward in a battle. Now, that's all the boring part, but if we look at military history, in the, in the World War II, Battle of the Bulge. Anybody ever heard of that? It was the most decisive battle that we ever fought in World War II. It decided the end of the war. And there was this little bitty town called Baston. Anybody ever heard of it? About four or five people. This particular little town was tiny, teeny tiny in the scheme of things. It was not a big populace involved. It was not actually, it was out in the countryside. The only thing that was specific to this area was it was a, and this is a quote from the military history, it was a great convergence of roads, paved roads, that people needed to get tanks and aircraft and supplies to their front lines. And as we know, history has proven out that Hitler kind of went to sleep at the stick, literally. And he didn't press forward when he should have pressed. And the Allied forces came. They fought very, very terrible, terrible battles. About 19,000 soldiers lost their lives just defending and holding this small town of Baston. What was the issue at hand? They needed all those roads. They needed access to them. So... The thing that we can do is apply it to our walk with the Lord, and that is that there are certain areas of your life that you need to hold. There are certain areas of your life that are so vitally important to your walk with the Lord that they're worth giving everything you've got. There are certain areas of your life that are worth giving your life for. And the thing that we can do is if we realize these things and we pick our battles, then all of a sudden any area of stronghold that the enemy has in your life 
can be broken down. You don't have to go around all the time fighting the fight. I'm fighting today. I'm fighting tomorrow. I'm fighting the next day. We're going to be wore out. The devil's going to win. In fact, is he's already won because you're seeing him behind every tree and behind every bush. The thing that we've got to do is realize there are certain areas of our lives that if we'll break down just a few things in it, all of a sudden we've made light years of progress in our walk with the Lord. One of those is addiction. If there's anything in this life that holds you back, holds you down, brings you down, makes you, you, know, uh, uh, makes you back up in your walk from the Lord... Those are things that need to be broken down. There are, there are some of us, even in this room, I'll guarantee it to this morning, that there are certain ones of us that have problems. It might be with alcohol and drugs. Maybe nobody else knows about it. Maybe it's an area that we have struggled and struggled and struggled and we've said, I'm going to break this. Only to find ourselves back in the same spot. To find ourselves in a, in a situation where we... I mean, all of a sudden, you're there and it's just like Peter whenever he said, Lord, I'll never deny you! And I've been there and I've done that early in my walk with the Lord and it was like, it would break my heart. Because I said, God, I will never be here in this place again only to find myself here. And sometimes we think it's only us. We think we're the only people that ever struggle, that we're the only people that ever give in. It might be pornography. It might be addictions to drugs and alcohol. It might be all kinds of things. It might be letting our anger get out of control. It might be any number of things. But all of a sudden, we said we wouldn't do it again, and we're there. And Paul, in Romans chapter 7, Paul, who's a hero of the faith, he said... Same thing for him. He said, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. Who shall save this wretched man that I am? And see, some, and the devil wants us to think we're the only people that ever deal with stuff. He wants us to isolate ourselves. He, he doesn't want us to talk. He doesn't want, he doesn't want it talked about in a pulpit. I mean, seriously, how many sermons have you ever heard on this subject? Very, very few. I'm not comfortable talking about it. But I felt like that's where the Lord wanted us to go this morning. It's not a jump up and shout hallelujah kind of sermon. Amen? But it's one that we all need because, see, here's the thing. Every person struggles. Every person has some weakness in their areas. Every person, if you want to call it this, has a demon that they wrestle with. And it's not always the same for everybody. And you might look at what I struggle with and say, oh, that's silly. But it's what I deal with. I might think what you're dealing with, oh, that'd be easy to beat. But that's because I don't struggle with it. If you, don't have a, if you don't have problems with anger, then you think somebody that blows their lid all the time, they're just, uh, what's the matter with them? They're letting their emotions run away with them. Yeah, but it's what they deal with. Or you might look at somebody that has an addiction and say, why do they keep doing that? They don't want to. I don't know how many of you are on Facebook, but I posted a picture a few weeks ago and it says, don't judge somebody... Because their sin is different than yours. Amen. We all miss the mark. We all do things that we say, God, I, I can't believe it. Here I am all over again. And I said six months ago, I'd never be here again. But here I am. God, I blew it. And sometimes we allow it to separate us from God. He tells us in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we'll confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we do that the first time or two. But then we say, God, here I am again, and I know you're tired of hearing from me. And then maybe the fifth time, we don't even pray about it. And the tenth time, we don't even go to God at all. Because we feel like we've blown it. We feel like God is done with us. We feel like there's no way God could, God could come back in. And God's saying, Read it like it was the first time. If you'll confess your sin, 
He's faithful and just to forgive it and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Though a man may fall, a righteous man shall arise. That's what the Bible says. It it doesn't say the first time or the tenth time or the thousandth time or the ten thousandth time. The only thing that's important is that you get back up. You may have fallen off the wagon, but don't get hung up in the wheels. Amen? Get out, roll out from under that wagon. Get up and get back on top of this thing and declare, I'm doing it this time with the help of God. I will be victorious over this thing. And yeah, you may fall and trip again, but get back up and get on top of that thing. Amen. Every one of us deals with stuff like that. I'm telling you, in church world, what we do is we paint on this smile and we put our finger in our dimple and my, 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 life is grand. Because we're faking it. Gosh, golly gee, you never thought you'd hear this, did you? (laughs) I'm just telling it like it is. We come in and, hi, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. And sometimes on the inside, we're dying. And we feel like Peter. God, there's no way you could ever come back in. Peter, you know, you know the story. He did not. And Jesus had to give a specific invitation for Peter to come back in. Because Peter had given up on it. He went back to fishing. You know the story. But he said to the, to the women, you go tell my disciples and Peter that I have arisen. And that was what it took for Peter to, to come back. To realize that God had forgiven him. Uh, and, and so many times we, we again, we're, we're listening to the truth voice of God. The law says. The law says, and the law says, and the law says, and, but grace is talking all the time. Paul said, you know, uh, he said, I wouldn't have known sin except for the law. It's just an identifier, a big pointing red arrow at sin. But yet he said, where sin abounds, grace abounds much 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 more amen you can't sin big enough to make god not love you amen you can't sin enough that he's going to turn his back on you he's always ready and willing that if we'll confess that sin that he is faithful and just to forgive it somebody say amen so it might be area of addiction it might be your finances boy that got quiet Preacher, you done, quit, you done quit preaching and you went to meddling right there because you're talking about my money. It's my money. But here's the thing. God's got a plan for your finances. And that plan includes blessing. See, here's the thing. And we don't think about this. We go to a restaurant. Somebody comes and serves you your food. And hopefully they didn't put their finger in it or anything. Be like the, the, I heard about this guy. He went to a restaurant, ordered a big old steak. Comes to the table and... Waiter's got his thumb over the edge of the plate holding that steak on there. He slips it down there, puts it right in front of him. This guy's looking at it. He said, hey, buddy. He said, uh, do you know you had your thumb over the edge of the plate and it was touching my steak? And he said, yeah. And he said, that's so it wouldn't fall off again. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Couldn't help but slip that one in there. But if they give us good service, what do we do? We're going to tip them. And we give them 10 or 12 or 15% anymore. They expect 15% on everything. And here's the thing. God has said to, to break the curse on your life, 10% of everything you make ought to be given to the Lord. In Malachi chapter 3, you can read it for yourself. This is not thus saith Brother Philip. This is what the Lord says. He says, should people cheat God? Yet you've cheated me, and you ask, what do you mean? How have we ever cheated you? And, and, and he's talking to Israel here, but it applies to all of, all of our finances. And he said, but you're living under a curse, for the whole nation's been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Where's the storehouse? Where you get your source from. And so he said, bring so that there'll be food enough in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I'll open up the windows of heaven for you and i'll pour you out a blessing so great you won't have room enough to take it all in put me to the test that's the only time in the word in the whole bible that you'll see that phrase god says try me and see if i won't pour you out a blessing that big and he goes on and says all the benefits and see it's not so much we're talking blessing and cursing and it's not so much that god puts a curse on you for not giving 
It's that he can't take the curse that's already there away when we don't give. In the Old Testament, in Genesis, the very first time tithing or giving, a tithe means a tenth. Anytime that's me- the first time it's mentioned in the Bible, it's whenever Abraham had gone out, won a battle, and had the spoils of war with him. And Melchizedek, who was the first priest really mentioned as far as, as, as anything in the Bible, and he's the priest of, of the God of Salem, Jerusalem, as it came to be known. And he says... Abraham gives him the tithe, and what, what Melchizedek, this priest, does is blesses him in return. Everything that you lay your hand to is going to prosper. All that good stuff. Praise that prayer. And the thing that God's telling us is, if we'll honor him in our finances, which is the power of this world, what makes the world go round? It ain't love. Money <laughs> makes the world go round. It is the power of this world. And if we're willing to say, God, I trust you more than I trust money. I'm going to honor you in my finances. If I tip a waitress that brings me my food, why would I not honor God enough to do the same? Amen or on me. (laughs) And he says, because you do that, I'm going to lift the curse. See, whenever sin entered into the picture, remember Genesis chapter 2, there was a curse that was placed on man, the woman, and the earth. Man's going to have to earn his living by the sweat of his brow. Going to be pain and childbearing, and all the women said, Amen. I knew I could get amen there. There would be a curse on the earth that it, instead of bringing forth good things, it would bring forth thorns and thistles. That's the curse. And if we'll honor God in our finances, he said, I'm going to lift that curse off of your life. And he goes so far as to say, Try me on for size and see if I won't do it. And it's as easy as that. And sometimes we have such a hard time in it. But here's the thing. Bring it down to brass tacks here. Before I got the idea that God does that, that it's a blessing to give, and there's a joy in giving, I was God's $20 man. I mean, you pass the offering plate, I was going to put a $20 bill in it. Yeah, because I'm, I'm a giver. I mean, woohoo! <laughs> And I'll never forget the first time God spoke to me, spoke to my heart and said, I want you to give $100 in that offering. I mean, I'm having this little argument in my mind. Are you serious? $100? Do you know how much that is? That's five offerings. I mean, because I was God's $20 guy. I didn't mind giving a $20 bill. I mean, I was very, very comfortable there. And God says, I want you to give $100. I can tell you where I was sitting, and what church I was in and what the problem was that they were taking up an offering for. Because, I mean, it like, are you kidding? And God said, no, I'm not kidding. And I'll never forget what I felt when I put that $100 in the plate. And it's like, man, alive, has this money got a hold on me. Because it's what makes the world go round. It's, I mean, it's nothing but paper. Have you ever realized that? Paper and a little bit of cheap coinage. And it's got such a hold on our lives that we can't get the blessings of God because we're not willing to release it. I mean, it was, when I learned that you can't outgive God it was the greatest day in my life. And I've been a tither and a giver ever since. I don't, and I can tell you this, and I'm not saying it, in a braggadocious way, but I remember where I was sitting the first time God spoke to my heart and said, give $1,000. And what the need was and where I was, because I went, <laughs> again, are you kidding? It's 10 offerings. <laughs> I gave it. And it was such a release in my life of God's blessings. And he says it. Why do we doubt it? We, we talk about it all the time. We pray for, pray for somebody to be healed, and they're healed, and we're like, <gasps> I can't believe it. Well, why did you pray? Take God at his word. And what I'm telling you is when, when, whenever we get a hold of the idea that we can't outgive God and that, the, that he's got greater things in store, I'll never forget. I've been a tither and a giver ever since. We, my wife and I talk about it. We know how much we give. The other one knows how much we give. And, and we make sure at the end of the year I compare my W-2 with, with what I've given. Because I want to be sure and not shortchange God. Because I have seen him work such miracles. I've told you before, whenever I was working plant work and God called me into the ministry, I was making, at that time, and this has been 26 years ago, 
And at that time, I was making $25 an hour, 24 and change. $25 an hour. That was good money. We left that for $400 a month, guaranteed. We never did without. We never went hungry. Our kids always were clothed. It might have been, it might have been not, not what they wanted, but they always had clothes. They always had shoes on their feet. God has been so faithful to me that I, I will never doubt him again in that area. And it, it is such a, a blessing to be in that position to say, I trust God totally. And, you know, and, and, and we've, t- I mean, we've talked about it in so many different angles, but here's, here's my thing. God's true to his word, and he says, try me out. See if I won't do it. Start where you are. Break that. This is what you got to do. All of us have a choke point. My choke point was 20 bucks starting in the beginning. So don't you think I'm up here saying, right? You don't need to remember. Because my choking point was $20. Because I was God's $20 man. I'd give $20 for anything. Amen. <laughs> and then he said, give 100 So what I had to do was choke my choke point. And then when he said give $1,000, I had to choke that $100 point and get rid of it. Wherever you're at and whatever you are with God, it might be a $10, you might be God's $10 gal. You might be God's $20 man. Choke it. Choke it. Prove God. He's the one that said it, not me. That's a big stronghold in our life. It's an area of our life. If we ever break down the strongholds, you've made light years of progress. It might be addiction. It might be finances. It might be other things. It might be strife in your home. And uh, let me share this with you because I had it down, but I got way, way, way off my notes. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, it says, uh, Paul's writing, and he says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. How many of you have ever heard? Money is the root of all evil. Yeah, we've all heard that scripture, but that's not what it says. It's the love of money is the root of all evil. And actually, when you look at it, it's not the root of all evil. It is a root of all kinds of evil. If you look at it in the original language, that's what it says. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not a root, but the root. And and what I'm telling you is that sometimes in our finances, we allow that to hold us back. We allow it to to rob us of blessings that God's got because we're holding on to what we've got instead of what God's got. Amen? So, and believe it or not, this is my last point. So those of you who are thinking, God, he's going a long time. You can go, He's, 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 he's got the airport in sight. Okay, the planes, I got my landing gear coming down right now. (laughs) <laughs> my wife is your best friend on shorter services i'll just tell you that but and that brings me to this point strife in the home <laughs> boy did she step right into that one I, we hadn't talked she didn't do that with my cue <laughs> but james says this he says for wherever envy and strife is there is confusion in every evil worker I think that one actually says, it's it's James chapter 3, for wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, you'll find disorder and and evil of every kind. Matthew 12, Jesus says, a house divided cannot stand. Strife is always a precursor to division. And if there are things that are causing strife in your home, it might be the addiction. It might be the the financial thing. Maybe one of you is wanting to give and the other one's not. Whatever it is, strife in a home will not work. And so what we've got to do is allow God to come into our life. It's just like this. It's a little triangle. And here's God at the top of the triangle. And here's you. And here's your, your spouse, significant other. The further you get from God, the further you'll be from each other. The closer you get to God, the closer you're going to get to one another. And and that is a true, true statement. I've seen it happen so many times in both both positions. I've seen people draw away from God, and they got further and further apart, and sometimes ended up totally away from each other. But the closer you draw to God, the better it is. And, and, I mean, you look at the day of Pentecost. When did the blessings come? Whenever they were all together in one mind, in one accord. It doesn't matter what group it is. It doesn't matter if it's a home. It doesn't matter if it's a church. It doesn't matter if it's your work. Whatever it is. If you can get in one mind and one accord, that's when God is going to work. 
Amen? That's when the blessings began to flow. And, and, and you've got to realize, hey, if there's strife in there, and, and what's my part? Because sometimes we're the instigator. Sometimes we're the person that's causing the strife. When we first married, Angie and I were neither Christians. Neither of us had ever been to church other than darken the door a few times for a funeral or a wedding. And I'll be honest, we had our ins and outs. First two years were pretty, pretty rough. We all both had our, our own baggage. And sometimes, gosh, this is mean. They say confession's good for the heart. But this is how, how bad I was. Sometimes she'd do something to make me mad, so I would just see how, how quick I could make her mad. I would go in with that intent in my mind and in my heart. I'm, I, I, everybody's got a button to push, and hers, hers are easy. I could push them from here. <laughs> and I could still do it if I wanted to, but I'm not, because I'm different. <laughs> But I, I'm telling y'all, I was so good. Ten seconds was all it would take, and I would have her like a rocket to the moon. And sometimes I would just see how quick it could happen. But I got saved. <laughs> and it's all different now. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> so here's the thing. I mean, it was, always <laughs> it was always like she said one time, you've always got to have the last word, don't you? And I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Somebody just got that back there. I don't know. <laughs> but you got no friend closer than, than Jesus, but the next person in line is your spouse or people in your church. We may not like each other. We may not like what all of us do, but the one thing we've got is we love one another. Why? Because Jesus said to Got no arguments there. I don't have to like what you do. You don't have to like what I do. You may say, this guy's... Uh, I heard a story one time. This little boy came up at the end of the service. And he had a little bit of money in his hand. He said, here you go, preacher. He handed him the money, and the preacher looked at it and said, well, you don't need to give me your money. And he said, yeah. He said, my daddy said, you're the poorest preacher we've ever had, and I wanted to help out. <laughs> so you... <laughs> You might think I'm the poorest preacher that we've ever had. But here's the thing. You don't have to like it, but you need to love me <laughs> to be right with God. And in our homes, if there's strife and envy and jealousy and all those things going on, we cannot be the, what God wants us to be. If there's strife and envy and jealousy in the church, we can't be the lighthouse into the darkness like God wants us to be. So the thing that we got to do is get used to each other. And yeah, we may all have some rough edges, but hey, the thing is, have you ever, have you ever seen a creek or, or some place where there was a lot of rocks that worked together whenever the water came through? Some of them are just as round and slick as could be. Those things didn't start off that way. They started off with rough edges. They started off with, with jagged, cutting edges. And as the water came through and rolled them around together, all of a sudden they're real smooth and slick. And they just glide off of one another. We all come in here and we've got our jagged edges and we all bring our history and our past, but whenever the water of the Holy Spirit comes in and rolls us around a little bit together, guess what? All of a sudden we're not a bunch of porcupines huddling together because it's cold outside. We're the family of God. And there are some awesome things that happen whenever the family of God gets together. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I told you the airport was in sight. Nobody's looking around. I'm not even going to look around on this. But as an act of faith, if you're here in this place right now, and you just say, God, I've got something that I need to win a battle over. It might be my anger. It might be an addiction. It might be my finances. It might be strife, envy, jealousy, whatever it is. God's not judging you. God loves you. And he wants you to have the victory in every area of your life. So right now, with nobody looking, including me, just as an act of faith to say, God, here I am, and I need your help to win this victory. Would you just slip your hand up toward him? Just to say, God, here I am, and I need your help. 
God, we are a needy, needy people. We can't do it alone. We've proven it. We've tried it. We need your help. And God, so many times, whenever, whenever we're just uh, uh, open to say, God, I need help, you come in like nobody else can. You come in with your power, your strength, your wisdom, your knowledge of our situation, and you are able to do more in a split second than we can accomplish in a lifetime. So God, do that work in us. Allow the Holy Spirit, and I know the Holy Spirit spoke to more people than just me about this thing. And I want you, if you raised your hand, if you've got something you need to get the victory over, I just want you to say this. Dear God, say it out loud. Dear God, with your help, I'm going to win this battle. I'm going to defeat this thing. And I'm going to springboard ahead in my relationship with you. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for giving me strength. Thank you for giving me wisdom. Thank you for giving me revelation about this. On how to beat it. How to beat it once and for all. And I thank you for rescuing me. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Give the Lord a big hand clap because I think some, some chains are getting broken right now. Still, with every, just go ahead and close your eyes one more time. If there's anybody here, maybe you're here today and maybe you're saying, Brother Philip, I don't know God like you're talking about knowing Him, but I want to. There's something in my life that I just need to get the air clear with God. I feel like if I left here, I'd be in the wrong if I didn't just confess it to God, ask Him to save me. So if that's you today, just by an uplifted hand again, you say, I want to make things right with God. You're not joining the church. You're not doing anything but saying, God, I need your help, and I want you to save me. If that's you, yes, yes. Anybody else? Very quickly, you can just slip it up and back down. Yes. Anybody else? We're going to pray you raise your hand i want you to pray this prayer i want you to say it mean it from your heart dear lord save me you know all those things that i got in my life i haven't confessed them to you but i'm confessing them now rescue me save me lord jesus i thank you for dying on that cross for me you died in my place you died for my sin so that i would not have to experience hell one day but I'll get to experience heaven with you. Thank you for loving me and saving me. Would you please lead me, guide me, direct me, give me a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit so I can stay away from all those things that weighted me down. And I thank you for loving me and saving me. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Give the Lord another big hand clap for that.